I'm Dylan Marma, and you're listening to Operators and Allocators, a podcast dedicated to exploring how to make smart investment decisions and execute well in real estate and private equity. We'll be interviewing top-notch sponsors from various asset classes to understand how they think and the frameworks that they put in place with the goal of achieving above-average risk-adjusted returns. Welcome back to another episode of Operators and Allocators. This is your host, Dylan Marma, and today we have a very exciting guest on the show. We are joined by Dave Zook. Dave is a successful business owner, entrepreneur, and real estate investor. He has invested in a wide variety of different asset types over the years. Um, He's invested in over 350 million of real estate investments from multifamily to self-storage to uh, various other types of investments in the energy space, um, more recently car washes and and so on. So we're going to definitely have a really interesting conversation talking about his experience and what he sees in today's market. Uh, He has also invested and deployed over 200 million investor capital with his partner into the ATM space. So certainly excited to talk more on that. Um, And he's been able to contribute a lot to the real estate community. He's very well known as a number one bestselling author and popular guest speaker. Um, And I'm also lastly, selfishly excited to be able to talk about what he's doing in the outdoor hospitality space, glamping space with some recent projects that he's actively involved in. So welcome to the show, Dave. Dylan, it's good to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Of course. Great to, great to have you here. So, so where do we begin? Why don't uh, you start off and just give us a quick background, how you got your start um, in real estate and investing as a whole? Sure. So I uh, grew up in a very entrepreneurial business friendly family and our family business is um, modular buildings. So I grew up in that business. I, I was uh, grew up, you know, kind of went through every different facet of um, the business and got myself in a position where uh, I ended up in the office and sort of running the fam, uh, you know, run, running the family business with my brothers. And um, so got, um, you know, really got immersed in that and got myself in a position um, a couple of years later, I'm, I'm watching my dad invest in real estate and I'm watching him self-manage some single family homes. And I just decided that wasn't going to be what I was going to do. I, I just uh, didn't want any part of that. And uh, so went down the business path and I specifically decided not to invest in real estate. And um, so went down the business path, built a couple of businesses, got myself in a position where I ended up with a big tax bill more than a decade ago. I'm paying a half a million dollars a year in tax. Um, just, you know, at that time, I mean, I was having so much fun. It didn't even feel like work, but when I had to give half my money back to the government, it it's, uh, wasn't so much fun anymore. And so I started reading a lot and started you know, doing a deep dive and going into um, Robert Kiyosaki's teachings or read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and, and um, realized by getting around him and his team and the real estate guys and realized that, you know, real estate can do a number of things, not just build longer term wealth through cash flow and equity, but it can be a real tax protection vehicle. And that's the kind of vehicle that I was most interested in at the time because I was making a lot of money, but I was paying a lot of tax. And so I sort of approached the real estate space from, from that lens, from that direction. And, um, you know, since then got my tax liability under control and now kind of operate through a different lens today, but still use real estate and, you know, real assets to offset tax liability on my ordinary and passive income. Yeah, that's really good stuff. I, I love it. You uh, tried to try to get away from it and found your way, found your way back, but for good reason, right? To be able to offset taxes. And it sounds like you did a whole lot more than just offset your taxes over time as you, as you found your way back into real estate. So uh, I take it, was it multifamily that you first started to get more active in and when, when you started to pivot into real estate? 
Yeah, so uh, I, I actually started uh, buying multifamily apartments myself. I, I acquired a couple hundred units of my own and then ran out of money. And uh, you know, of course, I was using cost seg studies and bonus depreciation and and doing all that. Got myself in a position where you know my tax liability is now under control. I, I actually went from paying five hundred thousand dollars a year in tax to paying zero. Um, I, I jumped in both feet. I was aggressive. It was a great time. It was you know two thousand ten, eleven, twelve, mm -hmm. and um, so you know got my own tax liability under control. I really didn't set out to um, be a syndicator. I, 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 I wanted real estate for a very specific reason. And then when I, then when I figured out that, um, you know, it was working for me, I got my dad and my brothers involved. Um, I got, um, you know, we bought some more units, um, got to the place where we're, you know, used up most of their excess Tap capital. Them out. <laughs> yeah, I ran them out of money too. And then uh, I reached out to some, you know, you know, the deals kept coming and I had a great team. And, uh, and so I reached out to uh, some uh, relationships I had in the community through doing business here all my life and I uh, got those guys involved. And I sort of just kind of migrated into the space. I, I, I didn't set out to be a syndicator. It just sort of happened uh, organically. And so, yeah, it was, it was an interesting journey, journey but um, that's how I began my syndication career. It was sort of by accident. So you went out, started buying your own multifamily, started to bring on investor capital. And then what I really want to hear about is, is at what point you started to diversify and seek at, you know, additional opportunities. It sounds like, and you may have been doing some of this the, the entire time, um, but it sounds like now you've also explored different avenues within ATM space. Now I know right now you're big into self-storage. So maybe if you could just start by sharing what you'd consider to be just your mental framework of, of how you decide if an investment is right for you. What are the key fundamentals you look for in any investment? Um, so to me, it's a combination of, of you know, I, I entered the space through tax. I still, you know, the better I get at this game, the more fun it becomes. And so I think that everybody should live tax efficient. You know, I think, you know, I think I, I know that it's possible. And I think, you know, I mean, it's very possible. And I think that everybody should should do that. So, you know, oftentimes investors will come to me and they, they want to talk about, well, what's the best asset class for me? And, and it, and it always depends. Like if you're a doctor making a half a million, $750,000 million a year, you're, you're looking much different than if you're a, and that's assuming that you're a W2 specialized doctor making that kind of uh, income. That's much different than a business owner um, who's got equipment to purchase, who's, who's scaling his business, who's spent a lot of money hiring employees, really, you know, growing the business. And it's also much different than someone who's got a lot of passive income. Those are three different scenarios. So I always like to ask the question, well, you know, what's best for me? What, what, what I like best may not be a good fit for you. So I like to, to look at, you know, several different income buckets you know, and this is for myself, you know, I got a, a passive income bucket, I got an ordinary income bucket, and I got a, maybe a capital gains bucket, and then just lining up different asset classes to offset, you know, to use the depreciation from those different asset classes to offset those different kinds of income. And so I look at it through that lens. Number one, I would be tax efficient investing in an asset class that I believe in. Okay, so then then you look, then you start looking at the other benefits. You know, some people may say, "Well, look, you know, tax tax efficiency, you know, comes after cash flow or comes after equity." Well, for me, that's baked into the cake. I mean, the investment's got to make sense. Okay, so the investment's got to make sense first, and then mm -hmm. when you you know layer in that other those other things like depreciation, bonus depreciation you know, uh, depletion, depending on the asset class. Um, but no, just, you know, for most people, high paid professionals or, or you know, uh, high income earners who are paying 37% tax, you get rid of the, you get rid of that tax, 
that's your first year's return right there. That's a 37 per, that's a 37% return. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to it. I like what you said about it. It really starts with looking, taking a look at where you're starting from and trying to, to build from there because there's not a one size fits all strategy to uh, these types of investments. So what has you excited in today's market? Where do you believe the biggest opportunities lie in today's market, maybe starting with real estate and then and maybe anything branching off of that? And then where do you think the biggest risks are in, in today's market? So I think in, in the current market, I think the next decade is, go, is going to belong to the real asset investors, people who invest in real things. Um, you know, it's uh, over the last decade, if you if you just threw a couple darts and, and invested, well, if you would just invested in the S&P 500, you'd have, you'd have, you'd have been fine. Uh, will that continue? I don't know. Uh, but I, th- I believe the, the next decade is going to belong to to the guys who invest in real assets, real intrinsic value, real real stuff. Um, I like energy. I like natural gas. Um, when I see what's going on overseas, uh, I see that uh, Japan, China, Asia, Europe, some of those, most of them, many of those countries are paying 30 to $40 spot price on their natural gas. We think, I mean, we're making a killing at five and, you know, spot price is five. And when you consider that you can send it overseas for a dollar, for, for a dollar 50 per NCF, you know, let's say, let's say you can produce it at, Two fifty, two dollar and fifty cents, and ship it for another dollar fifty. That's four bucks, and and you see what the overseas markets are paying for these uh, for for the spot price. Um, there's a ton of margin there, so I always say follow the money. You know, we're we're looking at, you know, we're watching the big multinational companies build out the infrastructure, spending billions of dollars per year down at the ports to to ramp up their export facilities. Well, that's a clue. And so I'm, I'm bullish natural gas. Um, I, you know, I, I really, every asset class that we show to our investors is asset classes and um, businesses that I'm personally invested in, heavily invested in, I, you know, because at the end of the day, it, it, it starts, and this is going to sound really selfish, but it starts with me. You know, what do I want? What's going to keep me tax efficient? What's going to give me cash flow? What's going to build a lot of equity? You know, and and do I love it? And am I cutting seven figure checks for it? Um, if that if the answer is yes, I can't help but share it with people. And I somehow I just start in it. I just, somehow I just end up starting a fund and and do it. You know, scale it up and do it in a bigger way. That's great. So take an example like natural gas. You know, how did you come across that space as a whole? Is it just generally, do you, do you just spend a lot of time reading trends? And then when you find something that looks interesting, do you start going and vetting partners or people that are active in the space? And you know what, what does that look like from the standpoint of, from the spark of the initial idea to the time you spend learning up the space? And then how do you vet the right partners to work with? Well, and that's a good question. And, and, you know, it's, it's for every 10 investments that I make, I don't know what the number is, but it's probably 10 or more that I make. My investors never see that, never say, never sees the light of day. Um, it might be a number, there might be a number of reasons. It might be a, a good investment, but it, you know, maybe it's not something that can scale. Maybe it's something that I can't scale and it's not big enough to take my investor group. Um, it may be me dipping my toe in the water with my own money and vetting out, trying out the operator to make sure that number one, we like working together. Um, you know, we, we, we work well together. We, um, they operate, they perform many times. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, making sure of those things before I go into it with my own money, but still, I want to know, I want some operating history with these guys. I'll give you an example. I was 
investing in ATMs for about four years before I brought it to my, uh, to my investor group. Um, I was a natural gas investor for almost four years until finally in December started a fund. Um, you know, so oftentimes I'm vetting that investor or vetting that operator, working with that operator, making sure that I like working with them, making sure they can perform. And, and, and sometimes, you know, as it was in a natural gas space, I mean, you look across the last four years, you look at the spot price, there's times when the spot price dipped down below a dollar. You're not making you're not making money in the natural gas space when when the spot price is less than a dollar. Um, but my conviction was strong. I I believed in the longer term story. And today, uh, you know, I built those positions back then. And today I'm getting the checks. And and you know, it, it's it's fun not only to be to get that the kind of return on investment, getting you know four four and a half percent return on investment. Um, monthly, uh, that's fun, but it's even more fun sometimes when you when you call it right. You know, you 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 followed your conviction. You 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 know you you watched the you know what was very obvious that what was going on you know internationally, even stateside. Watch the infrastructure being built out. It took patience, but then seeing that through, and and then now today being able to cash in on on your conviction that back then wasn't profitable at all. Uh, that's just a lot of fun. But normally that starts with me going out and investing my own money and really getting to know the operator. What are the top traits you like to see in the operators you work with? Uh, track record, uh, performance, uh, relationships with their investors. Oftentimes, I uh, if you're... If you're an operator, even in the even in an asset class that I like and believe in, and you cold call me or I meet you somewhere, you know, at an event or or some of that, you're probably not going to get my attention. But if I start hearing your name over and over again uh, in the investment community from your investors and from people who've done business with you, and I start hearing all kinds of good things, I mean that's a giant shortcut. And so, mm. you know, now you've got my attention. I'm much more interested in what your partners, what your investors, what your, you know, people who um, you're serving. I'm much more interested in hearing what they have to say about you than what you have to say about you. And um, so normally it starts there. That's a giant shortcut. Awesome. How about on the real estate side specifically? Um, how do you view the multifamily market today where what parts of the more traditional or even some of the alternative stuff i know you're big into storage you know what uh what do you think right now of today's market and where things are in terms of cap rates and potential for growth and things along those lines i uh i was just talking to a multifamily investor yesterday he was actually a syndicator and of course he's looking for cash flowing assets and and, uh, you know, we got to talking a little bit and he, he told me any more of the projections that they make. I mean, you're really going to make your money on the sale. So what that tells me is there's not, I mean, you, there's not a whole lot left to squeeze out of, you know, as far as when you guys start making your projections based on a future exit price or a future profit in the end and almost bypassing the thought of making any cash flow. I don't know that I want to be in that space. Mm -hmm. I I bought my last large multifamily apartment in late 18. Um, I, you know, obviously could have kept going for a little while yet. Uh, and, and, you know, I quit a little early, but I just think that you're closer to the top than the middle. And, uh, you know, there's more downside than up. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and the other thing is, going into you might as well forget about going into a stabilized asset and trying to make any kind of decent return i um, mean when you see what the big institutional players are are paying uh for those types of assets it's uh it's pretty ridiculous and and so if you can go into an asset and you can force the value you can you can you know somehow make it better you can do some sort of development or some kind of upgrades and and raise that NOI. Sure, there's, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's opportunities to in the marketplace to make some money still. 
um, you're just there just isn't a whole lot of low hanging fruit at this point. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you feel about the storage space? It sounds like that's where you're most active right now. Um, do you, how much of a runway do you feel like that space has? I know cap rates have compressed there as they have in most other spaces, but what's your view long term on that space? Sure, same thing. I mean, you you can't. You can't figure in. You can't figure on going and buying an institutional quality asset that's stabilized, and figure on that's going to get you a nice return. Whether that's you know upside appreciation in three to five years or aggressive cash flow, those deals those days are gone. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can go in, oftentimes we're going in buying from a mom and pop operator. We're you know in an underserved market. We're doing some, many times we're doing some kind of development. We're adding um, climate controlled units, uh, then turn around and getting that asset stabilized. Now you're at the size and scale where you're retarget. You deliver that kind of a product. You know, you take a 50,000 square foot or 75,000 square foot facility and turn it into a 100, 125,000 square foot facility, get the NOI up, get it totally stabilized. And, and, and now, we're sort of like the middleman between the mom and pop operator and the institution. So we take a mom and pop operated uh, self storage facility, do all these things to it, force the value into it and get it ready. You know, we're basically prepping it for a, a, an institutional exit. And so there's a lot of margin there. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of margin there when you can do that, but you, you have to force the value. I mean, it's, it's not going to happen automatically. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of parallels in, within self-storage as to the MHC space in that sense, as well as caps cut have been, been so compressed that the stabilized product is really, really hard to compete on in today's market. So you have to find the stuff with upside. But I, I think the point you make is probably that there's a bigger spread on your stabilized cap from the point of your stabilization versus the the entry cap, then then you might be able to find on traditional multi, right? If and say multi, you probably buy it a four, bring it up to a six or a six point five, right? Whereas maybe on these storage deals, you can buy it at a you know four or five if it's really low income, and and bring it up to a eight to ten or some something like that, right? You bring it up to a higher higher dollar amount and then you get a bigger spread when it comes time for the exit. Is that fair to say? Yeah. No. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, we, we, you know, the REITs are, are paying, you know, cap rates in the fours. And so when you can take a, you know, let, let's say you even buy a, a mom and pop facility at, at a four cap, it doesn't matter because you're going to add so much value you're going to turn around and, and and add so much value and then turn around and get it stabilized. And and then, you know, by the time it's ready to sell to REIT at a, again, a, a four cap range, I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the margin in there between, you know, what you purchase and then three, four, five years later when you sell is ridiculous. And uh, so that's what we've really done well in the self-storage space. That's great. So tell us a little bit about the ATM business. Um, I know I've heard your name tied to the ATM business for the last few years, but never really been able to deep dive into how that business model works and what's behind it all. So maybe you can share with us a little bit on the return profile and the tax advantages, if there's any tax advantages there. Uh, so we just get the give us the, uh, the elevator pitch. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's uh, start with um, the business model. So normally there's sort of two different kinds of operators in the ATM space. You have the mom and pop operator. They'll run around and, you know, they can service up to 150 to 100, you know, maybe 200 machines, ATM machines in a 50 mile radius. It's a, a very sensitive um, business, as you can imagine. So many times those, those guys are doing all the work themselves. They're, you know, they're, they're, doing the maintenance they're filling the machines up with cash it's a very hands-on business um and then on the other side you have the institutional players you have cardtronics and the likes um publicly traded companies billion dollar plus revenue companies 
Um, there, all of your uh, your maintenance contractors are audited. And, you know, there's cameras everywhere. Your your you know Brinks and Loomis, the security vehicles are bringing in your cash. The you know there's there's you know third party audit work. There's cameras everywhere. Everybody's watching everything. Sounds expensive. Um, <laughs> that's the institutional uh, space. Um, it is, but you've got scale and, and you can, you know, easily handle that. Um, so we operate somewhere in the middle. So, and we're the only operators that operate in the middle. You either have one or the other. So what we're doing is we go out into the institutional space. We take down the large portfolios could be five, 10, $20 million. And then we bring it back to our, uh, investors and we chop it up in bite-sized pieces. Uh, you can buy a unit of ATMs, which is six ATMs, uh, for $104,000 if you're an accredited investor. And that $104,000 pays out a $2,142 per month in cash flow. And, yeah. and you mentioned, you know, is it tax friendly? It absolutely is tax friendly. That's the icing on the cake. It's 100% bonus depreciation in year one. Wow. So um, many of us, um, do our pla uh, do some of our tax planning around ATMs. So no leverage. This is all cash. Um, generally, there's no leverage. There are some uh, guys who, including myself, who have good relationships with their local banks, with their local lenders, um, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to get leverage. But as a general rule, no, it's a okay. it's a cash investment. It's not something that you know one of the big five banks will will go and loan against taking the ATM as collateral because it's a, you know, it's a depreciating asset. I mean, you look at, you know, look at, look at an ATM machine, sort of like a laptop, mm -hmm. a laptop computer. You know, there's no bank going to take, you know, use a laptop, laptop computer as, as collateral because the, the, it depreciates so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so generally it's a cash investment. Got it. Yeah. Plus, I'm sure the bank doesn't want to be chasing around an ATM machine, right? They have better things yep. to do. <laughs> so, okay. Very cool. And uh, on to the topic with the uh, camping site. I know you mentioned you have some land you're looking at doing a development deal in that's going to provide what it sounds like cabins and possibly alternative accommodations as well. Um, have you been active in that space Previously, and it sounds like your family comes from the modular business. Has it been largely cabin related or all different types of modular that you've been working on? Sort of. Um, well, first, I'm, I'm a big short term rental fan from a consumer perspective and then also from a provider perspective. Mm -hmm. I own short term rentals in New York, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Tennessee. I own short term rentals on the river. I own them in the mountain. I own short-term rentals that we that we put up on you know 10 foot in the air and call them a tree house uh, yeah I, nice. I love short-term rentals I love them for for you know a bunch of different reasons again from a consumer and a provider perspective mm -hmm. um, I would much rather stay in a short-term rental in a hotel uh, as many other people would um, so uh, you mentioned property in Tennessee yeah we we actually bought 24 acres um, and we're developing that 24 acres right in the middle of Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Um, and, you know, we're, we're putting, we're, we're really focused on unique stays. Uh, we feel like there's a lot of opportunity with unique stays. So we're trying to, you know, not just put a cabin or park model on it, but, you know, get a little creative with it. I mentioned, you know, and it depends on the landscape, depends on where you're at, depends on if you got a view or if you're on the lake or river. Um, you know, the, the one place in Pennsylvania where we have one that we, you know, put up in the air on, you know, 10 foot poles, um, that's overlooking a valley with a, you know, probably a 10 mile view. Um, so it depends It um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I was born and raised in the modular building business. So we, we, uh, see a lot of what other people are doing in the space with our product that we build. And then, you know, we get ideas for our own products and try to get them unique. And, and, you know, when you ask the question is what would my wife and I really 
consider unique and what would what would it make what would make our stay special mm -hmm. and then you go to work and try to provide the guests with the with the best possible experience you can it's 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 a fun business yeah that's great definitely big on the short-term rentals as well i know we have a bunch in uh, some of our campgrounds and i think there's a huge shift from the traditional primitive camping cabins where you bring your own linens and you're lucky to have decent heating at night to to more of the short-term rental cabin stay with, that's you know all, all we're all inclusive with you know everything done for you um and you know even though you're paying sometimes as much as three four times as much <laughs> um for, yeah. for that experience i think there's the the markets out there in today's world so um to your point with the unique stays i think that's really going to be the big question in the next couple of years is I think you know, a lot of a lot of people getting on Airbnb and trying to come up with these one off unique stays, but how do you scale that or is it really scalable and. Um, you know, I think we, we like the cabins on the campgrounds because you get to have one full time cleaner that can clean all of your your cabins, rather than having to um, rely exclusively on all different types of contractors in the local areas that you're in. Um, but what do you, what do you think about that? Do you think that over time, the STR business will evolve into something that institutions start to move into? And do you have any ideas in terms of how to scale the unique stay experience? Um, you know, that's a, that's a great question. I've never seen it as an institutional product. I've seen it more as a small investor or mom and pop type of a product. Um, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. It could happen. Um, and I know for ourselves, I mean, you talk about efficiency, you know, using the same cleaner maintenance guy for six, eight, 10, 20 properties. And we're doing some of that in Florida. In fact, we just had one come online, um, today in mm -hmm. Sarasota, Florida, and we were building a position in Sarasota, Florida. Um, we bought four homes down there this year and, I had a friend of mine who's in the remodel rehab business, who's actually done a lot of work for us up here in Pennsylvania. I had him move his family down. You know, I, I asked him if he wanted to move his family down to Sarasota for the winter to work on a couple of our homes and get them Airbnb ready. Yep. And um, so um, absolutely, if you can, you know, do some kind of scalability on your own and, and kind of, you know, have more than one home in a neighborhood and sort of, you know, kind of build your own little um, community, you know, four, six, eight, 10, 20 homes and, and kind of, you know, tap into some of your own network instead of doing one-offs, you know, definitely there's some scalability there, but I don't know that it's scalability at an institutional level. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It definitely does. Because even, even then it's still probably a relatively small check size. So depends on what type of institutions are out there. So definitely all makes sense. Well, well, hey, we've covered a lot of great stuff here today. So uh, maybe before we wrap up, can you share with us a best practice for one for an active operator that is really looking to get into real estate for the first, you know, say their first commercial deal, uh, and then a best practice for a passive investor who's interested in starting to vet syndications or funds? So I'll start with the passive investor first. I, I think uh, from a passive investor perspective, do the same thing that I did, get out there. This, this investment community is fairly small. And so if you get out into the investment community and start having conversations and start asking good questions, uh, you'll soon find you know, operators who have a good track record. And, and, you know, to me, if you've got a good longstanding relationship with investors and you've got a good track record of performance, um, you know, and, and people are saying nice things to about you in the marketplace, that's a, that's a giant shortcut for a passive investor as well. Um, I, you know, of course, I'm doing that on the operator side, trying to team up with an operator and trying to, you know, do that you know, from a scalability perspective, but it works the same way with a, with a passive investor looking to invest his first 50 grand. Uh, from an operator perspective, uh, everything that I just said that you're looking for from a passive side, you want to be that operator. You know, you want to be the operator that 
you know, builds a track record that builds relationship with your investors that that causes those investors to say nice things about you in the marketplace. That's where you get momentum. So it, it sort of works both ways. And and you know, you you want to you want people out there saying nice things about you because you know at the end of the day you can cold call you can try to you know create um, your own book of business and have people invest in your deals, whether it's ATMs or self-storage or whatever, but it's a much, much easier and, and it's much more fun when you're uh, doing most of your business, which we are now at this point, we're doing most of our business with repeat and referral investors, much easier. But that doesn't happen unless you can, you know, unless you can have that vibe going on in the investment community and you can have other people saying nice things about you. Yep. Uh, that's definitely very true. And I, th- I think it gets hit on all the time, but you can't say enough. It's all about the trust and just the relationship you have with investors. I mean, that's the number one, I think most important thing. Uh, and that takes time to, to build and sort of, uh, what is it built, built in drops and lost in buckets, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thanks so much, Dave. A lot of great stuff we covered on the show here. Where can listeners find you online? So the real asset investor.com is our website. And if you want a report in just about every asset class we talked about today, uh, we can get you set up with a report. Just send an email to info at the real asset investor.com. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for joining us on the show and thanks to our listeners for tuning in to another episode. All right. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on another episode of Operators and Allocators hosted by the Equity Group, a vertically integrated private equity real estate company. You can find recordings of all shows along with other resources on our company website, therequitygroup.com, also listed in the show notes. A brief disclaimer to our listeners. Information presented herein is for discussion and illustrative purposes only and is not a recommendation or an offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities. All investments are subject to risk and past performance is no guarantee of future results. The views and opinions expressed by the Equity Group speaker are their own as of the date of the recording. Any such views are subject to change at any time based upon market or other conditions. We hope to see you next week.